And we will give the floor to Robin Win Winter, <laughs> Winter, yeah, uh, with this talk on unsupervised learning on group invariant and equivariant representations. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And um, yeah, we'll talk today about uh, our recent work. So actually, there's a, a recent preprint already out. So you might want to check. Um, yeah, so the work is about unsupervised learning of uh, group invariant and equivariant representations. And this is joint work with uh, Marco and Tuan uh, from the uh, Bio Machine Learning Research uh, Department. And actually, Tuan is giving the next talk here where he also um, presents his uh, follow up work um, for confirmation prediction. So, um, okay, that's not working. Do I have to do something? No, it's working. Okay, perfect. Uh, so um, I first have some motivation slides, but uh, as you probably followed the last talks and the last day's uh, talks, uh, this might already sound really familiar to, the, to you. So the main idea is basically that um, many properties of interest of data you uh, might work with uh, have some inherent symmetries. So, for example, uh, most uh, prominent, uh, the label of an image of a digit um, does not change um, under rotation or translation of the image. The composition of a set um, of uh, like balls, uh, like you can see here, does not um, change under does not change uh, under permutation of the elements in the set, and. Um, the uh, yeah, for example, the conformation, like the binding affinity or the ground state energy of a, a molecular conformation, does also not change under rotations and translation in three dimensions. The problem, however, is that uh, the data is often expressed in a way that does not respect the symmetry. Right. So, uh, for example, images are often or mostly represented by these matrices of pixels, and if we transform, translate, or uh, rotate them, uh, the ways of the pixels change. Um, sets are represented by matrices where different rows correspond to different uh, elements in the set and if we now permute different elements the uh, the matrix will also change and as you saw in the previous talks if we represent uh, molecular conformations by atom uh, like the cartesian coordinates at the atom centers of the molecule this will this representation will also change under uh, um, under um, operations like rotation and translation. So these different transformations can be uh, described uh, by uh, so-called symmetry groups. And we have here, for example, like the special Euclidean group in two dimensions or the special Euclidean group in three dimensions. Um, and the idea now is, um, so in contrast to the previous talks where um, we basically either defined uh, or use some equivariant neural networks and supervised learning to tackle these representations or use some uh, invariant um, uh, atom descriptors, for example. Here we uh, try to um, learn these representations that respect the symmetry in, um, um, in an unsupervised way by uh, utilizing autoencoders. And if you think about it, you uh, might wonder like, okay, how do we actually uh, do this? Because uh, autoencoders are trained um, on this reconstruction uh, objective, right? So you have an encoder and a decoder, which are randomly initialized, and uh, you uh, compress your input with the encoder and try to reconstruct the input uh, um, uh, by training and tra training the the, uh, the autoencoder on this objective. Um, the problem is now if you uh, represent your data in this. Uh, uh, way that does not respect the symmetry, the reconstruction objective will also not respect the symmetry, and thus you have to encode this information, uh, this uh, non invariant uh, information in the representation, and you will not be able to learn this invariant uh, representation. Uh, you might uh, design an uh, encoder that is invariant, but then you have the problem in the reconstruction, right, because you can only reconstruct the, uh, the input up to um, the group transformation you want to be invariant to. Um, and then uh, your reconstruction loss will be high, even for uh, the, the best case scenario. And to put this into more formal terms, because in the paper we actually don't show this not only for rotations, but actually make this general for any kind of group. What we uh, in, uh, in general want to do is we want to encode um, like orbits of uh, groups G through some data space X 
to one um, Latin point in a Latin representation. So again, to make this more uh, like tangible, I put again, like uh, the simple uh, um, examples of images uh, with uh, rotation. So here we have like three different data types of fruits like apples, bananas, and pineapples in different orientations. And one orbit would now be like uh, the apples in all the different orientations. So this is what we want to find one representation for. Um, so in essence, our encoder has to be invariant if we want to find one uh, representation only for an orbit. And the problem again is now that in the decoding part, the best thing we can do is to map to one element in the orbit, but um, uh, we don't, do not know in, a, in like uh, in advance which element this will be, and we don't want to force the decoder to uh, to decode to a certain element. This is basically. Uh, uh, degree of freedom of the decoder that is learned uh, during the process. Um, but the problem is now, of course, so in this um, learned um, um, element uh, we decode to, we call it the canonical element uh, in this case. The problem again is that uh, if we calculate the reconstruction objective, this will be uh, even in the best case scenario where we encode maybe this apple, but uh, reconstruct that this apple. Uh, this is the best the, the method can do, but it will still get a high reconstruction loss, right? Because the reconstruction loss is not invariant. So what we um, do here to solve this problem is to uh, basically learn the group transformation that will like align again those two uh, inputs and outputs um, um, uh, objects to each other. So we want to basically learn this uh, group representation that aligns the uh, decoded canonical element with the input elements. So we have to uh, define this learnable function psi, which makes, uh, maps the input element x to some uh, to the uh, to the group basically we want to be invariant to. And uh, so in the, in the cartoon, this looks like this. So we have an uh, encoder eta that uh, encodes the invariant part and the decoder that uh, reconstructs the canonical element, right? But now we also have this psi encoder that um, encodes the equivariant part, so the group function, basically. And we use then this uh, predicted group function applied on the canonical element and uh, then reconstruct the input in the right orientation and then we can uh, calculates uh, the reconstruction um, loss again. And again, like in the paper, we show how we define this psi in, um, uh, for any group and what kind of uh, properties the psi has to fulfill to make this uh, a work. Um, but here, like due to the time limit, I cannot really go the, into the details of the math here. I just show uh, two examples. And the first one is uh, for the rotated MS case, so images again of uh, digits. And uh, in diff uh, so this is like the common benchmark, right? But here we have different rotation, uh, rotated versions of these MS images. And uh, we want to learn an auto or like a representation that is invariant to these rotations. So it should not matter how you rotate the input image, uh, the representation should be the same. And we utilize here these, um, uh, these um, nice networks uh, proposed by Wiley et al, which are like equivariant serial CNNs and two dimensions uh, to define the uh, invariant encoder and the equivariant uh, uh, group function psi. And for you to kind of get the idea, what we are doing here is uh, we, we use psi basically to predict a point uh, Y on the unit circle and you can maybe see that if we, if we uh, predict such a vector here, we can then with some reference points uh, calculate an angle, which we can then use to construct a rotation matrix, which is then used in the, um, in the decoding process to recover the um, original orientation. And since we use here uh, fully equivariant uh, neural networks, if we uh, somehow rotate our input, the predicted uh, group function or group uh, rotation in this case will uh, rotate equivariantly. So we, uh, we basically are by design equivariant, which is a necessary property uh, basically here. And if we look into the results, we can see that uh, for different uh, orientations of uh, the input image, like here one, three or six, we can see that the canonical predicted output is always the same orientation, right? Because the uh, representation is always the same, and the, so the output um, digit is then always the same, the canonical element. Uh, but once we apply the predicted rotation, uh, the input and output align again. 
And if you now compare also the embedding of, the, uh, of our proposed um, architecture to a classical autoencoder, we see that um, like expected for different orientations of digits, you see different clusters in the original uh, autoencoder. And in our case, we only see one cluster because the rotation does not affect uh, the, um, uh, the, the representation that we learn. Uh, maybe a more uh, complicated example is now if we go to three dimensions and here we also include uh, the symmetric group to um, handle uh, permutations because uh, here we look here uh, on the toy data set of uh, these Tetris shapes and three dimensions and here we want to also encode different orientations and rotations of uh, these Tetris shapes. And um, here we utilize uh, SE3 equivariant uh, networks like uh, the transformers proposed by Fuchs et al. or uh, equivariant GNNs, uh, which uh, Tuan uh, developed, which he will uh, talk more in the next talk about. But here it's uh, slightly more um, complicated because now we also have to not only have to predict the rotation, but also the tr uh, translation metrics and permutation metrics by this psi, because these are the basically the group elements we want to be invariant to in our representation. But uh, indeed, this also works. So here you can see uh, maybe a bit harder to see it because it's in three dimensions. Here we plotted again the inputs, the canonical output and the output after applying the, the, the group transformation. And you can see that after applying the group transformation, the uh, input and output align again. And so we can see that for all the different orientations and rotations, we see that only like one uh, representation is learned um, in a two dimensional embedding actually. This is not a projection. And um, yeah, maybe just a, a quick spoiler for the next talk. We also applied this now on um, conformations, which is maybe most relevant for this audience. And here this also works for this slightly more complicated uh, case uh, compared to Tetris. Uh, so here we encode uh, like uh, molecular conformations by their uh, Cartesian coordinates. So no further like uh, invariant descriptors or uh, internal coordinates needed. Um, so we can um, autoencode this um, and reconstruct uh, these are the predicted versions uh, while tunneling through like an invariant uh, representation. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to show you. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Are there any questions? Do we have another microphone? Yeah, so I will take one here. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice talk. I have two quick questions. One is uh, like, what is the dimension of the bottleneck of the autoencoder relating to the size of the molecule or? Uh, here, I've, so for Tetris, it was two dimensions right here. I think we use like 32 dimensions, that, but mm. this is really hyperparameter. Uh, I mean, at some point, if you go too low, then at some point uh, this mm -hmm. uh, will deteriorate. But the, the embedding is, again, the embedding is for like the whole molecular graph, right? So we have like, not like atom centered uh, representations. Yeah, and the other question, uh, can you somehow make this independent of the size of the molecule, of the yeah, number of sure. atoms you have? The, okay. You have one representation for the whole uh, conformation for the whole molecule, and this is independent of the uh, the size so that's that's the main yeah. reason uh, or like one maybe my one. question is like do you can you develop one universal autoencoder for the whole chemical space yes yeah, yeah. okay so maybe I mean, like at some point it would break if yeah. you go out of the training uh of course okay. yeah but we we tried up to 32 uh, uh atoms so we haven't tried it now for like proteins for example but in theory yes other questions? Uh, yeah. So when you said for any group, yeah. uh, do you mean for any compactly group or any group? Uh, so for yeah, we we showed it both for discrete and continuous groups. Yeah. But uh, is compactness a necessary condition for your algorithm? It's a good question. Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but the way they deal with translation maybe makes it uh, all free. So, I mean, uh, and also is it 
only for finite dimensional representation you can learn. Sorry? Only for a uh, representation of finite dimension. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. So the the uh, encoder part that's doing the equivariant bit, right? Did I understand correctly? It's effectively learning a sort of normalization, some canonical uh, direction, say a facilitation yeah, that, group. That's that's correct. I so mean, you can even see that uh, it kind of learns to for the digit part. I mean, it's nice to analyze, right? So you can see that it aligns basically the uh, main. Uh, Axis of variance uh, along one axis. I think so. This is like how it kind of learns the easiest way for it to uh, reconstruct the difference. Yeah. So then you said that you didn't want to impose this because, of course, I yeah. mean, maybe for some uh, symmetry groups it's difficult to think of a normalization, but for, say for rotations, you can always say, like, oh, well, the first principal axis should be X and so exactly, on. Exactly. Yeah. Did you not want to do that because it's not so easy for other groups or? Yeah, exactly. So we didn't want to uh, imply any uh, like, um, yeah, uh, canonical orientation advance. We, we wanted the network to learn it's like the best way for itself to learn this problem and to uh, represent it. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. In the interest of time, I would suggest to um, keep future questions for the coffee break or the poster session. So one applause again to the speaker.